All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the, uh, the files framework presentation. And you're going to miss out on coffee and cookies or whatever they have out there because we're going to keep going. <laughs> Um, I think, though, that there's going to be a lot of time where uh, there's going to be a number of people that are probably going to want to keep playing around with uh, the files framework so during the exercises and stuff. Um, so th th there's sort of two parts to this. There's the presentation, which has no code in it. There's not a, a scrap of code in the presentation, because I, I needed to spend a lot of time with the files framework explaining the motivation, why, why it exists. Why is this something, out of all the things we could have chosen to work on, why did we choose to work on this? Um, so that's sort of what the presentation is really about, is really explaining the, the rationale that we went through in coming to this as a project, and the work that we've put into it, and sort of the background. Because I really think it's going to help people understand how this sort of fundamentally changes the way you can approach network monitoring. because. My experience playing with it already and playing with a few other people running it has sort of been a little profound for me in a few ways. And it was a very interesting change. So the mo motivation was um, the workshop, for those of you for the workshop that was in 2001, everyone was like, cool, the way files are handled is neat. You can say, I want to extract these file types out of HTTP. And you could say, oh, just extract all the Windows executables. Just extract everything. But there were also complaints, and there were complaints in my head from me where I was complaining to myself, like, why are we handling things separate for every protocol? Why, is, uh, why can't we do more with it? So we really ran into this problem where it was just wildly inconsistent. The, the file handling was like handled specifically for SMTP, specifically for HTTP, specifically for uh, FTP. Everything was really handled separate. There was also the, this nagging thing in the back of my head. So there's a secret that, that hasn't been talked about very publicly. I destroyed Bro's performance with 2.0. Robin was a little disappointed that I did what I did, but it, it gave some neat capabilities, so I did it. The problem was that files are transferred in protocols, which are all decoded in the core, which is C++ code for the most part, and it's really fast. But then I made the decision, but I want to do all this stuff with those files, and we didn't have any capability to do that. So all file data was passed into script land. So which meant every chunk of every file is available to you as an event in Bro. And if you had a 10 meg file transferred over HTTP, Bro was sitting there doing an event with every 1K of that into script land. It's a huge number of events. It's a lot of memory copying. It's not real great. And I knew that this was a performance issue, because this was something traditionally that like Vern and Robin had always shied away from, because they knew that this was bad, right? True. Exactly, true. <laughs> uh, they had always shied away from writing scripts like this. Or when they wrote scripts like this, for instance, um, uh, file hashing is one of these, because you have to hash it, you have to make every chunk of data of the file you know, feed it into a hasher. And they had always shied away from that or made it something where you could be like, let's look at HTTP, but not look at file data, right? like that sort of stuff. But it's, it's so incredibly important to be able to look at the file data, because that's a lot of what's actually going on, especially when you see uh, malware doing things, like what the file it's transferring typically is the important thing, or maybe not the file. So file is, is sort of going to be heavily used during this presentation. And it doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, it's a Windows executable. It just means it's a byte stream, essentially. So it's saying, here's protocol traffic, and then there was a byte stream that was transferred. That might be a file, it might be a streaming video, but we treat it all sort of as a file, because it's something not the protocol. Um, so anyway, it caused performance problems. That was sort of the big point there. Everyone, we've heard so many times, bro works, it's amazingly fast. Bro, it's, it's great that we tricked everyone into believing that. I feel really happy that everyone thinks Bro is fast. But we, it, from my, all indications I've seen, Bro 2.2 is going to be quite a bit faster. And, and you'll be doing more, and it'll be running faster. So it's kind of a nice combination of more functionality and running faster. It's also not extensible. Like, 
I've been wanting to be able to do deeper file analysis for a long time. And really all we had was um, you know, hashing. And it had a performance overhead for doing it. And I wanted to be able to do more. And with the, the current design, 2.1 being current, um, we couldn't really extend it anyway. If it would have sort of every little extra thing we did had a pretty massive overhead to doing it. Um, so it really wasn't extensible. It's also wildly uncool, right? The whole point of Bro is to take stuff that's insanely complicated and make a layer here that's less complicated that some people are going to want to work at this layer. And make a layer here that's less complicated where some people are going to want to work. And a layer here, so we have like all these layers that you can work at that progressively get more difficult to work at, but we've got the very easy sort of shell on the outside of it where if you don't know anything you're doing, I, I've, the, the last couple of days talking to people, I, I, I realized something that I hadn't really, I think, wrapped my head around quite so concretely. Bro is actually easier to run than TCP dump. I mean, everyone can kind of accept that, I think, because if you're on TCP dump, well, you probably have to know the dash s flag to make sure you're getting the full, like dash s zero or whatever you want to set it to, to make sure you're getting the full snap length. If you want to see like packet contents, you probably have to do dash capital X or, or something like that. Bro, literally, you get tons of output from it just from bro dash r packets. You know, you can give it some packets. Oh. Sorry about that. Insufficient at miking myself. OK. So anyway, just keep in mind, 2.1 is uncool. 2.2 is going to be super cool. <laughs> so I kind of started this process a long time ago. It, it was, uh, I think I was talking to Charles in 2011. So this was right after the 2.1 release, actually, that I started working on this. Um, he released this thing called Ruminate IDS, and I probably, I kind of ripped him apart a lot. And I felt bad about it, but I, you know, his thing was a, a research thing. And, but he had written these blog posts talking about reassembling traffic out of um, HTTP 206 range requests, where you're not getting the whole file, and you're getting like, part of it in this TCP connection, part of it in this TCP connection. And so it was something I, call, I talked to him a few times on the phone, and we sort of worked through uh, you know, what his thing does, and how it works, and why he chose to work on that, and just a lot of different things. And you know, I mulled on that for a long time. So one of the things was file reassembly. It's something that there aren't really any, there's not really any other network monitoring tools that do this right now, except for Ruminate IDS, which generally I, I think is something that is not well, I, I think he said it's not, you can't really use it. It's, it's not really operationally ready. And I, I don't think he's working on it anymore either. I haven't seen him do anything with it since 2011, actually. Um, so a big part of it, though, is file reassembly. So you can think, especially in like file transfer protocols, like, like actual, like think of NSF or SMB or something like that, they actually have things where they can do offset reads and offset writes and stuff like that. So really early, the first thing you realize is, well, I have to be able to understand what an offset read is and what an offset write is. So that was one of the you know, design considerations that went in, was this ability to reassemble files. And the other thing that Ruminate IDS really focused on was um, the ability to sort of pass things on to other tools. It's sort of in the same vein of like what uh, Sourcefire had talked about doing with Razor. Razor Razorback, that's it. I couldn't remember. It was some pig-based name. So that was sort of where it started for me. That, that was what kind of kicked me off playing around with a lot of this stuff and thinking about it. Because you can't, a lot of times, the idea is great. Like, it's like, awesome, that's great. But then what does that mean in terms of how users turn it on, how they change it, how they work with it, how it gets architected into our whole thing, and how it changes uh, things. How do we do logging with it? There's so many considerations that have to get put on top of that. So anyway, 2000, right after the, the Bro Exchange in 2011, in November, whenever that was, late 2011. Over the next, uh, Robin and I, I remember, had a long talk at um, 
the Bro Exchange last year, where we hung out and we talked about what this abstraction could mean in Bro. And this was way before we had started work on it still, but we sort of talked about what the abstraction in Bro means. And there were things that, you know, over the next year or so, I started realizing a file is a single flow byte stream. And I know that unless you're sort of in Oh, OK. I thought that was maybe mic feedback. So, <laughs> so it's a single flow byte stream. And that's significant in that a connection is a dual flow byte stream. You know, the, the originator of the connection is talking to the responder, and the responder is talking to the originator. And it's actually two byte streams. So that's what a connection is. And a file is just one byte stream. So you think of like a, a JPEG. You start at the beginning, you read through to the end, and that's your file. So that was, that was one big realization that, that I had, where there's nothing special about files. It's just a byte stream. Bro, the release that you guys have, the, the preview release and in 2.2, um, Bro can have file analyzers that work very similar to connection analyzers. It's just that they only, work, they only deal with a, a single flow. Um, and anything you can do. So you're really, it's this idea of taking a byte stream and reading through it and generating events. I mean, it's actually, once you really wrap your head around um, how analyzers work in Bro, like protocol analyzers, the file analyzers are like, oh, well, yeah, why did Bro not always have that? <laughs> it, it's, it's sort of a very uh, eye-opening revelation to realize that that's how it is. And then the next question is, like, how many, how many file types would you like to parse? Would you like to parse JPEGs? Would you like to parse TIFFs? Would you like to parse Windows executables? Would you like to parse Word documents? Would you like to parse on and on and on? zip files, rar files, just on and on, whatever you would like. Um, another realization was a file really is a base abstraction in Bro. So the, what, I, what I like to say is, uh, I guess, uh, files.log, so there's a new, there's a new um, log in, in Bro 2.2. And if you've run uh, that trace file that's included with the, on, in the VM and you run that, you run that with the bro that's included, you'll get a file called files.log. And it's, it's a little weird, though, because when you look at it, it looks very sort of disconnected from network traffic. And that was a very deliberate thing. Files aren't an aspect of network traffic, but they could be. A file could be transferred over zero, zero, um, zero connections. Because you could have just said, read a file off of disk. And actually, I implemented a prototype a few days ago where you ran Bro, it didn't sniff network traffic, and it sat there and it watched a directory. And every time you dropped a file into there, it picked it up, read it in, put it through some analyzers, and wrote it out in the files.log. So you could start thinking of the next step there, like, well, once we have lots of analyzers in Bro, or once we have integration with lots of external tools in Bro, Suddenly, you could have a thing that literally is you know, an analysis thing that just sits there, watches a directory, and as you drop files in there, it analyzes them. It can take actions based on them. If this is something coming from some real-time feed of files that you're seeing from your mail system or whatever, you could be dropping them in there, and you could actually be doing analysis on those. You could be taking long-term analysis, like, are we seeing more Windows executables today than we were yesterday? Like, like stuff like that. Um, so you can actually build these sort of weird systems that really have nothing to do with network traffic. It's just a file analysis. It's really just doing file analysis. Files have unique IDs just like connections. So anyone familiar with Bro since 2.0 knows we have these file unique IDs. Um, I think we're gonna, they're going to change a little bit for the next release. We've talked about expanding them to 92-bit uh, values instead of 64-bit or 92 or 96. I want to make that happen still, by the way. I haven't talked to you about that yet. Um, but we're, we're probably going to, so they're going to grow a little bit probably, but um, anyway. Yeah, so they have these unique IDs. And the idea is that, you know, we have this file or we have this connection, and this is a unique ID that's, you know, not going to be replicated. If we run Bro again, it's going to get a different unique ID. But the idea is that everywhere that something about that connection or everywhere something about that file is referenced, we can put that same unique ID everywhere. You can think of it like a foreign key. Files are also source agnostic. Um, this is sort of what I was just talking about. You could have a file 
well, a zip, a zip analyzer, right? If we had a zip analyzer, which I don't think we're going to have because we need to approach that carefully. Um, if we had a zip analyzer and you saw a zip file sent over SMTP and you pulled it out and you unzipped it, that file that you pull out or files that you pull out are children of that parent file. They weren't attached to the email. They were a child of that one that was attached to the email. So suddenly, you get into this thing where you could have files that get pulled out. So you can actually, and this, this is something in the files framework where you can have parent, the files can have parent. Imagine, um, and this is, This is just sort of it's something that we won't have for 2.2, but you can imagine like um, a PDF that has files in it, other files in it, or, or a Word document that has other files in it. If one of you writes a Word analyzer, it can go through and pull those files out, put them back into the file analysis framework, and so if, if there's um, a JPEG attached, you could actually get to the point where you do your normal JPEG analysis, which perhaps is looking for certain characteristic camera type or something. And what you can do is pull them out and say, you know, of all the Word documents we looked at that had photographs attached to them, it's a stupid example, but that had photographs attached to them, 90% of them were taken with this one certain camera type, which is an incredibly weird and incredibly sort of deep analysis, but I, it's possible. Um, Files also come from protocol analyzers. So if you're analyzing a protocol, you tend to run across files in, in many in many protocols. Or sorry, let's just say HTTP. We'll get it out of the way. 90% of this is for HTTP, just because so much of traffic is HTTP. The other place you can get them from is the input framework, which is how I implemented that thing that was watching the directory and pulling files in, because I would find a new file in that directory, and I would read it in with the input framework, and it would go into the, the files framework. So the implementation was really starting from that very first point. Keep file data out of script land. It's a terrible, terrible idea, and that's what everyone's running right now. So sorry, Robin. And for if Vern ever watches this, sorry, Vern. Um, so no, there's no reassembly yet, too. There's a somewhat of a caveat to that. So imagine, so is everyone familiar with, like, HTTP partial content request, where you can say, give me byte 0 through the end of that file. And it'll give you the whole file. But you could also say, like, give me byte 1,000 through the end of the file. And the server gladly comes back and says, all right, I just turned HTTP into a random access protocol. Here's byte 1,000 through the end of the file. Um, the idea is that eventually we'll actually be able to reassemble that. So you can imagine someone transferring a Windows executable over HTTP. But the first thing they do is grab the second half of the file. And then they close that connection. Like the TCP connection's closed and gone. Then they start a new TCP connection to that server and say, give me byte 0 through 1,000 one, through of that file. Or even worse, give me byte 0 through 1,050 of that file. And it transfers what we've put designs in place that we'll be able to add this later on, where Bro could actually reassemble that and reorder it in memory at runtime. And you'll have the ability to set, like, Per file, you could set different reassembly buffers. So, oh, if files are coming from this network, I want to give them actually a big reassembly buffer. So I, I really want to try and reassemble that stuff. Coming from that network, I really don't care. Just set a zero reassembly buffer, so it's never even going to try and reassemble stuff. The caveat to that is that if you extract files, that actually works right now. So if files are transferred in a weird order, the way John Suick did a lot of the work on the file framework, and he made the extraction plugin do offset writes. So it actually does a trick where it'll go ahead and write the second half of the file, and then it'll go ahead and write the first half of the file. So it actually works if you're extracting, which is a little weird feeling. When you look at network traffic and you actually pull it all back together correctly. So the file manager is, is, a, is a core component of Bro. Like you guys are never, probably never, many of you will probably never really bump across the file manager in Bro. But it's a new core component in Bro, and it's sort of like, the protocol analyzers, for instance, any of them that see files, they are saying, hey, file manager, here's some bytes. And they just sort of shove it off to the file manager. Hey, file manager, here's some bytes. The file manager is the one that sort of deals with making sure it understands, um, uh, can create the file unique IDs by some tricks that got put in. 
Um, it makes sure that it you know, can reassemble stuff if it needs to when that, that feature comes in. It makes sure the analyzers get attached. It sort of does all the, the work of this thing, but the real idea behind it is that it's its a, its own sort of separate component in Bro that data gets fed into. So I wanted to go into some logs real quick, because I think that's one of the really interesting things. So what this is is sort of a top-down dive through, through files in Bro. So what you actually see here is um, obviously an HTTP connection. I suspect most people here are probably kind of familiar. I cut some fields out because I couldn't fit the log on the screen. But what I did was I bolded the file, the connection unique ID, and then you see the, the, the actual connection ID. Um, you can see it was an HTTP connection, or Bro attached the HTTP analyzer to that connection. Uh, it, was, it took about a second and a half. The originator sent 66 bytes. I don't even know what that was, but the response bytes are what's interesting. It, the server sent back 49,337 bytes. And looking at the history, if any of you understand that, that's a pretty normal looking history. It, it's, a, it's a normal you know, HTTP connection. So the next thing we're going to go to, because it's sort of interesting, OK, it's an HTTP connection. Well, what was, the, what was it? So again, you see the connection unique ID, you know, some similarities just for linkage back to the previous log. So you've got the same unique ID to connect it to the connection log. You see trans depth, which means it was the, because you can do multiple HTTP requests in a single, um, uh, a single HTTP connection. You see it's the first one. The host header given was actually the IP address of the host, which is a little weird. I mean, I think that's things a lot of people will kind of pick up on when they're looking at stuff. It gets really kind of weird when you look at the URI, lprx.php. I mean, that's getting sort of weird. You see no refer, no user agent. Um, the response body length, 49152. Then here, this is the new stuff at the bottom. Response file unique IDs. Um, so HTTP uses MIME. Let's start there. MIME lets you do multi-part MIME. So a server can actually return 10 files for one request, theoretically. It doesn't happen often, but I think it's better to support things correctly. Um, so technically, you could have seen file unique ID, file unique ID. You could have seen a lot of file unique IDs there if the server did return a bunch of separate files or bodies. And it's the same. There's, there's also um, orig FUIDs. So for, so for things like uh, if someone posts a form or something like that, that'll be a orig file unique ID. And then you actually see the response MIME type. So you can actually see that's the sniffed thing. Everyone always asks that question. It has nothing to do with the header on HTTP. That's actually libmagic, uh, running the file through libmagic just to see what it got identified as. And I want to point out one other thing. With Bro22, John did some awesome work that I bugged him about incessantly. And um, we now are shipping our own copy of the uh, the normal libmagic database, because if we didn't do that, which apparently had some trouble to do that, but we've got it all set up now, I think. And I think that generally kind of works. It's worked everywhere I've tried it. Um, by shipping our own database, we get some benefits. Um, consistency. So we've had people before where a Windows executable on FreeBSD would get identified as this. A Windows executable on some distro of Linux would get identified as a different MIME type, where they're actually using different MIME types. Now we get consistency. If it gets identified as you know, application slash x dos exec, here it gets identified that way, here and here and here. The other benefit is um, we're probably, and I haven't fully convinced anyone else of this yet, I don't think, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to just start doing it for the next two, three, we're probably going to start doing tests for the LibMagic database. And this is something that I, most people, I think, don't think about. Are there tests for any LibMagic databases that are floating around? There aren't. And it turns out that they make changes to those databases that are untested. They could break stuff when they come out with new releases of LibMagic. We're probably going to start testing. We've already, our, ours actually has a fix already I think, for um, identifying um, uh, Word documents. There are some Word documents in the current libmagic distributions database that don't get identified correctly. There's a byte that's off a little bit. And uh, we fixed that already, so now those get identified. But the benefit we have over like the, just the, the guy, darwinsys.com guy that does libmagic, is we've got people that we talk to, they're going to be shoving 
millions and billions of files through libmagic. So we can say, what weird, lib, what weird uh, MIME types are you seeing? And we can slowly go and fix those, hopefully. And, and I've been doing a little bit of that already, at least categorizing errors and mistakes that we're seeing. So that'll be interesting to see. But anyway, I wanted to point out that we're trying to bring consistency in MIME type identification. And I've actually, I uh, approached Victor Julian at the Suricata project to see if they wanted to reuse our LibMagic database in Suricata, because I know they run into the same problem, actually. They added uh, MIME type identification to Suricata, and they see the same inconsistencies on platforms and stuff. So if I can convince Victor of that, they may start using our uh, LibMagic database, too, which will be nice, because it'll be more tests going into it, because I'm sure people in that community will also identify problems with the database. So HTTP log, still not super interesting. Files log, now it's starting to get interesting. This is where you actually see the timestamp. This is when the file was started, started to get transferred, like the first byte, of, the first byte was seen, kind of. The uh, file unique ID, now this is, the, this is where the, the equivalency with con log comes in. The, this file has its own unique ID. This is where I came up with these names. I, I'm really not sure. What I wanted to really represent, though, is transmitting host and receiving host. And keep in mind, those fields could be empty. If this was not captured from network traffic, if it was read off disk, those fields would be null, and they wouldn't have any values in them. But because this is network traffic, we could go ahead and do this. And it's hosts, plural, because remember, uh, files don't, don't have a one-to-one -one correlation with connections. You could have a file that gets transferred over 10 connections, perhaps. Um, so anyway, transmitting hosts. That's the server. So it's a little weird looking, because that's the server in the previous log. But now it's the one viewed as the bytes were on this server, and they're moving to this other. They were on this host, and they moved to this host. So you have TX hosts and RX hosts. And then you have the con UIDs. And that could be, again, a whole set of con UIDs. But right in this one, it's only one. And then you see source, HTTP. Depth is, is sort of protocol specific, depending on where it's coming from. Normally, it's probably going to be zero, I would su frequently suspect. Then you see analyzers. You see SHA-1, MD5, PE. Um, then you see MIME type, which is, again, the same thing. How long that file took to transfer, it's slightly less, because you have to think that the, the HTTP request took one and a half seconds. But that's from when the first SYN packet was sent until the connection was closed, I think. Maybe. It might be a little bit compressed. But either way, this is when the first byte of the file was seen to when the file ended. So you actually see it, it's shortened a little bit. Is a ridge says that uh, that's basically another connection-oriented flag that says this file was sent by the originator. So you know which, which direction. In, if it was from a connection, you know if it went from the originator to the responder or the responder to the originator. So because it's is a ridge and it's HTTP, or sorry, it's is a ridge false and HTTP, you know the server sent it. It was, a, it was something the client requested and the server sent. Scene bytes and total bytes are sort of having to do with how many bytes. Sometimes a protocol will say, I'm getting ready to send you 49,000 bytes. Um, but if bro doesn't actually see all those, you may have less in scene bytes. But then you see MD5 and SHA-1. Those are the MD5 and the SHA-1 hashes for this file. Um, and the exercises will go into how to enable that. And then extracted. If we had extracted the file, you would see the extraction analyzer here, and you would see a file name for where it is on disk. And I wanted to have sort of a money shot. So this is the, the PE analyzer log that will be in the next release. It's not done yet. It's not in the preview. But what this is actually analyzing the Windows executable. And it's, it's made for a 32-bit machine. The compile timestamp is here. So that's when the file is compiled, which is pulled out of the Windows executable. Um, the OS it was compiled for is NT4.0. That's a little confusing. You have to just understand Windows executables to understand some of these fields. The subsystem was Windows GUI. You see the characteristics, and you see the section names. Eventually, I want to go much, much further with this. I want to get, it's hard with the way the analyzer is written right now to go further, and I ran out of time. But eventually, I want to get imports, exports, have all of this available at script land, have it logged. For the most part, this is just going to kind of happen automatically. You'll run. You find a Windows executable. You get tons of information about it. Because how, wouldn't it be nice to just say, all right, so not only did we have Windows executables that got transferred, how many 64-bit Windows executables got transferred? How many that were compiled 
in this one week time period got transferred. And that's over any protocol, because if this was transferred over SMTP or FTP or HTTP, you're going to get that log. And it's going to look exactly like that. You can work with these unique IDs back through. You can go all the way to the connection. You can go, if it's in a tunnel, you can make it through the tunnel, find out the actual outer connection that it happened on. It's cool. I, this is really neat. <laughs> um, it took a lot of working to figure out how to pull all this together in a way that actually functions. And then sort of to go a little further, um, this is the Team Cymru malware hash registry match notice, which is now different. It used to be HTTP colon malware hash registry or something like that. Um, but now, because we've abstracted file handling, it's no longer about HTTP. We're just saying, I found a file, and it matched on the Team Cymru malware hash registry. And now I added a, a feature in it that could give a description about the file. And it, it's different. I've only got SMTP and HTTP implement, implemented right now. But if that was SMTP, what it would actually show is, uh, uh, what is it? Some email address sent to some other email address. And then if there's more receivers, it'll say plus four others. And then it'll give us a, a little cut section of the subject, if, if the subject's available. And so it kind of gives a description. So just from your notice log, you see that information. You see it's a Windows executable. You see the connection. And then you actually see uh, the detection rate that Team Cymru uh, registered at. And the reason this is wrong is it was old traffic. And they haven't scanned that file since 2009. But I also went ahead and added a virus total link. So it's using the SHA-1 of the file in a virus total link. There's no validation that that file is on virus total, but there's a lot of overlap between Team Cymru malware hash registry and virus total. So if you click on that, you actually see that virus total scanned it just a couple weeks ago and actually had 40 out of 47 of their scanners hit it as uh, malware. But if you really think through this, like what just happened? This was something like if you had this trace file and you just ran it on your, uh, and you just ran it on um, like the bro, you just did bro dash r or whatever, you would get all of this stuff. And you do absolutely nothing to get it. It just happens. And the best part is that it, um, it works at scale. This isn't some sort of like mocked up little demo thing that, that works. You know, the, the one site, for those of you that know, that's doing 13 gigabits per second is running, not the PE analyzer, but they're running all this other code. And it works. It's, it's faster than, than 2.1. Um, so right now, the included file analyzers, well, sort of included. Let's just say file analyzers, not included yet. Um, this is stuff I think should be in 2.2. Uh, two, two. Extraction, hashing. We do MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256. I should also point out. Um, if you just run bro with bro control, MD5 and SHA-1 hashing for every file will be turned on by default. So if you just start running bro, if you have a big network, you're going to end up with millions and millions of hashes every you know, hour. Uh, one site where they were having, in 40 minutes, they had 4.9 million hashes or something. But I think that they were only counting lines. So technically, they had the SHA-1 and MD5 for both of those. And sort of on, on a tangent real quick, because I like the story, I, uh, me and a few other people who were running this on real networks had sort of an interesting experience when we were all chatting. We started to behave like the virus industry. And I don't know how many of you are on like, some of these like, private communities where they'll be like, hey, has anyone seen this hash or whatever? That's coming to the, the, uh, the network analyst community. You're not really telling anything. You're saying, has anyone seen this hash? But if all your peers have like days or weeks or months of these hashes, you can say, has anyone seen this? I'm just curious if anyone's seen it, if it's a normal thing, if it's bad or good. You're not telling them the URL. You're not telling them anything. You're just giving a hash. And we actually started working this way. And we did. We saw hashes that other people had seen. It was a fascinating experience. And um, it, it, was, it was weird. I didn't expect that to happen, but it sort of emerged as sort of a natural behavior once we all had this data. Entropy, I wrote, <laughs> I wrote the entropy analyzer in about half an hour the night before last when I was supposed to be preparing this. Um, what it does is it actually uh, does an entropy calculation on the files that are being transferred. And I enabled it for all the files and from my really horribly back of the hand calculator, uh, testing, it didn't seem, doing entropy analysis on every file didn't seem to have any performance change. 
um, or it was negligible. Um, but what it does, it gives you a value. Uh, there's, there's one script. When we get it into, it's not in there now, but when we get it in, it will be one script you load, and it'll add a column to your files.log, and it'll say entropy. And it'll be a value that's somewhere between 0 and 8. It's a, it's a double, so you'll get like some big run on number. But I had an experience with that, too. I ran it on some traffic that I test stuff on a lot, and I found something new in it. I've been testing with the same traffic for years. <coughs> And I had never seen these requests, but when I ran the entropy analyzer, and I was like, OK, what's the most, the highest entropy of, of all the files in this thing? And so I pulled out that column, and I sorted. And there were things that were 7.999 something something, which is incredibly, incredibly random file. I mean, you can't really get to 8, but you can get really close to it. It turned out that it was, uh, a net, it was Netflix speed tests. They use random data. They use extremely random data for those so that no middle boxes can like, improve performance or something, because they don't want it to improve performance. They want to see the actual performance of the network. But it was interesting that, that those, all the ways I've looked at this traffic, that had never come up before. But I wrote this analyzer in like half an hour, and suddenly that just popped out to me. And, and the, you could see all of those requests, because those were all 7.999 something something entropy. There's, there's a data analyzer, because there is a need still to get some data in script land. I think, I suspect that over time, and I don't know if any of this is going to happen for 2.1, but I suspect, 2.2, I suspect over time this data analyzer is going to morph a little bit, because right now this is sort of a sledgehammer. I need data in script land, and it makes it available in script land, but it really isn't fine enough. I, I, there's a lot of other things, but this is sort of, you can say, you know, make this file available in script land, call this event, and then whenever you know, it gets a chunk of data, it'll make it available in, a, in an event. And you can handle that event and do things with it. And then there's the, the PE analyzer, which is Windows executables, and I showed you the log from. So there's actually an event suite for that. Like, all I showed you was the log, but there's actually a set of events that are for, like, the, the NT header and the, the DOS header and all the different parts of a Windows executable. They're all broken out into events, and this whole suite exists. So I guess we can move on to the exercises. Yeah, we'll go with the exercises, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. People can do whatever. I, I, I figure it's kind of open, but we'll move into them. I'll bring them up on the screen and give a little bit to do them, and uh, then I can talk about them. Well, sorry, wait, first. Are there any questions? That's sort of. I think wrapping your head around the files framework is sort of intense. And you'll see people refer to it as a file analysis framework, but I, I've sort of tried changing that term to the files framework. And it's hard to even change myself. I still say file analysis framework sometimes. But I really want to represent that it, it's a very new core part of Bro that's not sort of, it's not sort of a mock. And it's not uh, a prototype. Like, it's, it's, it's in Bro for good now, I think. Yeah. OK, that's true. OK, the question was about um, file names. There is a file name column, and I didn't show it in there because that file doesn't have a file name. Um, so what the file name column is, is some protocols, and not all of them, and not all the time, uh, will include a file name. So for instance, HTTP has, well, I guess I should say MIME, but I discovered recently there's there's the content disposition header for HTTP has its own RFC. Just that one header has its own total separate RFC. But uh, it's essentially MIME. And um, the content disposition header can include a file name. And it's when you go and you download something, and the URL is like da 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 dot PHP. But then when you download it, your computer will say like it's whatever dot exe maybe, or, or dot text or something. Um, I don't, I, I made the decision, I, I think it was the right one. I made the decision to not use any part of the URL as the file name for HTTP because it's just wrong to do that. At best, it's a guess, and at worst, it's incredibly misleading. Um, so essentially, what you see in the file name is if the protocol says, this is the name of this file, and I don't think I have it added for FTP yet because you, you do have the actual file name for FTP. I need to add that still, but um, 
But yeah, that's, that's the reason that you may not have seen any file names. Frequently, if you look, like on a real network, you look through the files log, you'll see it's, it's null in many, many, many of them. But then you will see it set. And the interesting thing is when it's set, it almost never matches the URL. If it's HTTP, it almost never matches the URL for the uh, request. So it is kind of an interesting extra little bit of information. Yeah? For those uh, calls to various folders, do you think it matches process now where you can pass it and now it's not doing an imposed method like the run or the call to virus total? Um, that was not an active call to virus total. That was an active call to the Team Cymru malware hash registry. What happened was that was a fabricated virus total URL. It's just a string. I don't do any validation to see if that's at virus total or not. OK, I'm just, I wasn't focused on virus total. Okay. It would be an active call from now on to the server. <laughs> that's actually been in Bro since 2.0. And there, I've talked to a number of people where they'd be like, I'm going to make it check Team Cymru malware hash registry or something. And I'm like, just search your logs. I know there's one person in the room, at least, that had that experience not paying attention right now. But uh, still not paying attention. But um, uh, Scott Runnels. Okay. Now he's paying attention. <laughs> um, so anyway, he had the experience. He was one day at his uh, previous employer. He was asking me, um, I, he's like, I, I want to write a script. And he's like, maybe I'll have it check Team Cymru Mauer hash entry. Because they have a DNS interface, and we do DNS at runtime in Bro, and it's nice. And, and so he's like, I'll do this. And I said, check your, I was like, grep your notice log for this. And he goes, oh, we had a hit yesterday. You know, and it was like hitting malware, checking that. So Bro has already been doing active stuff for years um, by default. I, I don't know if I should have turned that on or not by default, but I guess people have gotten good out of having that on by default, good or bad. Can you turn off? Yes, you can not load that script. <laughs> you can turn it, Liam was suggesting that I say you can also turn it off by just not loading that script. So the way, the way it's loaded by default is this local.bro script that we ship. Um, so whenever you see recommendations like, how do I load something extra in Bro or write my own script, you'll see us reference this local.bro script. And that's essentially where we've taken the decision to say, we don't think this is something that should be loaded by default, but it's frequently helpful. And so local.bro is sort of like you know an Apache's shipped HTTP.conf, where it's like, this probably doesn't fit you, but here's something. And um, so if you run bro from the command line, local.bro is not loaded. But if you run bro <coughs> with bro control, which is how everyone does it in production, it does actually um, load this, this script you know, among many others that aren't loaded by default. No. I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, so there's going to be more active stuff coming up. There, there's a talk that someone else, is, that's not me, is doing. <laughs> That's, uh, that's, that's about a, a mechanism we have in Bro 2.2 for doing more active stuff. Um, there's a lot of data that would be nice to get at it floats around various places, so we're trying to make that available. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the question, the comment was about it might be nice to document, um, you know, how to remain passive on a network with Bro, especially since we've sort of screwed everyone by default, where it's not passive by default. Um, yeah, that's that's tough though too, because if you choose to run some script, you have to be aware of what every script you're doing runs. We could certainly do it for things that we ship. But over time, you're going to start seeing more and more people writing things. And I suspect over the next couple of years, many of those are going to be active. Whether that's querying a local system just for like ticket information, or it's you know, querying a remote system for, for intelligence type data or something like that, I suspect there's going to be more and more of that. And it, I, I don't really know how exactly we're going to handle that. But um, yeah, I mean, at the very least, I guess that is a good point, that it would be nice for us to point that out, that when you run Bro, 
It's mostly passive. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's a little, could be a little confusing though because if you do DNS, you may end up doing DNS because the the Team Cymru one works over DNS and it could sort of go around the side kind of. Yeah. So um, because the, the payload data shouldn't be or is not available to the uh, scripting layer, um, would you say that payload data should be accessed via signatures then? Well, let's cut the word signatures out of that. Um, signature framework, rather? No, no, no. Just cut signatures completely out of it. Um, <laughs> Robin's going to kill me. Um, yeah, he's getting his <laughs> knives ready. But um, the, there's, there, we're sort of in a transition period a little bit because we've got goals and hopes and dreams and wishes. And there, there's a couple things that have changed. So like in 2.2, for one thing, analyzers are easier to write now. And there's going to be a, a, a presentation about that. Analyzers used to be miserable because you just had to plug them in all over the source code and it was confusing and complicated. Robin did an astound he didn't seem to think it was that much, but I thought it was a kind of astounding amount of work to uh, refactor how all of that works and plugins, so like analyzers now are completely self-contained in their own little directories. Like they they aren't you don't spread stuff over the whole source tree. You just do it in your own little directory and that's it. Longer term, though, there's a project Robin's working on, and this is what he'll kill me about, is uh, you know, the, the, the goal that we have is to turn this byte stream analysis into a, another domain-specific programming language. And there's a prototype that exists, but you can't use it yet. And, um, but it, so imagine that. Like, you had these byte streams available where you could just write a script. And it's meant to work at a low level. It's meant to be optimized for that use case. And it's reasonably fast. It's safe, for at least, because you're not doing it in C or C++. Compiles it at startup time. So there's a lot of sort of benefits there. And if you really kind of approach it from that perspective, you're like, if I have a language that's intended to parse byte streams, so you have the ability to like define structures and you can have those all parsed out and all sorts of really weird stuff that protocols and files have in them, you know, it sort of carries on. And you're like, well, that's nice. Someone can just put up on GitHub an actual analyzer of protocol or file analyzer, and I can just download it and run it. It's just a script. It's just a second language devoted for byte stream analysis. The Bro programming language is not meant for byte stream analysis. It's not good at it. You can't really do it. You could, but it's, it's bad. Um, so that's sort of the longer term goal. You know, unfortunately, right now, there's not a really great answer other than, well, you could use bin pack and you could write an analyzer and you know run it yourself. But um, <coughs> yeah, it, it, things are changing. We're still in transition period. I think we'll always. I don't know if we'll ever exit a transition period, but. Um, Maybe if we ever have to stop having ideas for big architectural changes we could make, but I think we have enough coming up that we're, we're not at a loss for ideas of architectural changes. Um, yeah, generally, though, you can use that data event. If you do need something at script land, you just have to understand that it could be a performance issue just because you're passing the data into script land. But on the upside, what you can do is actually pass data in. If you want to look at something like near the be that you think will be near the beginning of a file, you can actually pass data to script land and then say, well, you know, I've seen this much of this file remove myself. So like you can actually remove the analyzer. So if you transfer a 10 terabyte file, you can say, well, I've seen uh, I've seen 5K of the file. I don't want to see anymore. Remove the analyzer, and then it's not it won't send that data to script land anymore. It's hacky, but you know what are you going to do when you're in the middle of things? Um, so the, I think someone else, yeah. Um, 
Uh, I, I, he's asking about the entropy stuff. It was from your tweet the other day. You tweeted, and I was like, oh, why, why didn't we add that? That's what I forgot. That was what it was. I, you did the tweet about the entropy stuff, and then I was like, wait, why don't we have that as a file analyzer yet? And I, I wrote it that night right after you tweeted that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's using ENT internally, and um, it's, not using, it's not using the BIFs, but it's using the, the ENT code in, internally. I, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think ENT is like C, but I restructured it a little bit in Bro, so it has a C++ interface, and then I just use that. And we've, we've actually abstracted that even a little bit more so that we could make things easier out of script land, but for, it doesn't really matter that much for, for this use case. But yeah, so anything, essentially, the output from ENT is going to be the same as the output from Bro. And the only value all of the values that ENT calculates, the Monte, Par the Monte Carlo Pi and all the other ones, um, they're available, but my choice was to only, in the log, was to only include the entropy one and not include the others. But the others, the others are available. Technically, you could just put them all in your log if you cared to. Were there other questions? I, almost, I half expected to just go on through the whole time we had allocated for the, uh, for the exercises with questions because the, this this is a pretty significant change. <coughs> oh. Is that working? Oh, yep. So is there anyone that still can't run Bro? That's awesome. No hands went up. So I'm going to kind of let everyone sort of go. Uh, I think there, the break, prob there's probably stuff out there. So feel free to go ahead, take, get, a, get something. Lunch is, is there another presentation before lunch, or is this? OK. So I'll, I'll go through every 15 minutes or so and talk about one of the exercises. So uh, for those of you that are having trouble getting uh, directly to Git, there's a sponsored account access that's created for everybody. So uh, these were passed around. If you don't have one yet and you want one, just raise your hand and I'll go ahead and uh, get it over your way. Does anyone still need one? If you log on through this, it should go ahead and open up and let you use Git if that's your preference. That's what this is for. Yeah, we'll, we'll put them up here on the stage if you want. If you need to grab one. Uh, well, the, there's. We're just going to go ahead and do the exercise. I guess. Geez, we were really ahead this morning. We'll go ahead and do the exercise. If anyone has questions, I can go ahead and talk through stuff. So we're going to kind of. Let's just consider this the file analysis playtime. So yeah, I'll, I'll pay attention. If anyone has questions or whatever, we'll get someone over to help out. Ah, it's the link to this. Oh, that's a that's a link. The fafexercises.pcap is a link. You should be able you should be able to actually download that one. It's pretty small. I think it's only eight megs, five megs. It's a link. Oh, th this exercise page. Go to the. Sorry, I should have pointed that out. Go to the agenda, and there is a link at this at this uh, topic thing, and you'll get to here, and then you can click that link. So I, I don't know if everyone heard or not, but apparently, if inexplicably this happens, if you download the trace file in the VM, something corrupts it. If you don't download it in the VM, it's fine. OK, maybe sometimes when you download it, it's corrupted, and sometimes it's not. So if the, the last, uh, let's say, five characters of the, the MD5 sum for the correct file are D459C. So anyone with that wins some network traffic. Not the mug, just some network traffic. I believe it's stored in PCAP ng file format. 
I think that might be the problem. <laughs> okay, sorry. So sorry about that. The problem was that the uh, the the packet capture was stored in PCAP NG format. Here's a copy of it in PCAP format. So it was the problem we were running into was some people with PCAP supported PCAP NG and it just worked, and some people didn't, and it failed miserably. Oh yeah, let me let me run it through something that'll shorten it. Sorry, ruin it. Deal with it. There you go. Can I do this? Yeah, I suppose. I'll, I'll grab it. My power supply. Yeah. So I'm assuming every everyone accomplished exercise one that involves running bro. <laughs> okay. So did one thing I would like to ask, and this is really only for my own edification, because I view this as still sort of something we're working on and, and coming to terms with with how we use it and how we modify bro because of it. Did anyone have any thoughts? Or, or was anything particularly exciting or just anything? Yeah. Well, um, that's a local site decision. We're still working on something to, to make it so you can store more traffic. That Actually, someone good to talk to would be Ashish if you're interested in storing traffic without blowing out your budget. Um, so Ashish Sharma from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. What, what do you, you, you guys have a lot of traffic stored. Months and months. And what do you spend, $70,000? Six months of PCAP for $70,000 on a large network. So anyway, but um, yeah, I mean, you kind of run into the problem. So the raw traffic is nice because it's, it's the true truth. The logs are mostly true. <laughs> I, I still don't know the, the right words to use to, to really to get that across. but. You know, I mean, the logs can be misleading at times. They can be wrong at times. It could be bugs. Um, the thing that's not always nice about the traffic is that it's the true truth. Um, so I, I, I don't think I would ever espouse just not keeping traffic because you're replacing it with bro. That's fine if you want to do that as, you know, local site policy. Just you have not found the need for the traffic or whatever. But you know, that's really. That's a tough call. Uh, anyone else? Any thoughts or feelings or emotions? <laughs> uh, so okay, so the first the first one was really just giving you a taste of more than just a single log line. Like, uh, and I don't even think John. Oh, John isn't here. Thank you, John, for doing this because I had too much crap to do and didn't get around to it. So John wrote this exercise for me because he's <laughs> awesome and willing to do stuff like that. Uh, so anyway, these again, um, this well, this call, whoop, this column, the MIME type one is from sniffing the MIME type with our our custom libmagic database that you're all running. Um, so it's not based on headers out of anything. Again, because we get that question all the time. <laughs> it is not based on headers. We actually, I don't even pay attention to the content type header in HTTP anywhere because, like everyone always says, when they complain about this in Bro, it's unreliable and wrong. And I agree. And that's why we don't pay attention to it. Um, so, yeah, the, the base file by itself is not terribly exciting. It's a little annoying that you have to do some correlation. You can write scripts, actually. so. I think in the next one it, it does hashes. So anyway, the solutions and everything are all there. Uh, turning on file hashing is sort of ridiculously simple. This is the this is the script that's loaded by default. So actually, sorry, let me think. I don't 
I think I load this file in local.bro, which you can modify on your installation, and we won't overwrite that. Um, but if you load the Team Cymru malware hash registry script, it automatically loads that too. So like, say you unload this in local.bro, but you're still loading the Team Cymru malware hash registry thing, it automatically loads this file so that it can get hashes, because that script won't work if it doesn't have hashes. So. Sometimes you'll run into dependency things like that. Like the, the Team Cymru malware hash register script depends on having file hashes. Um, so anyway, this is really the, the very first uh, little introduction to, to how you work with the file analysis code, or the files framework. Here it is again. The files framework from the scripting land. If any of you are familiar with connection events, we try to keep very close sort of parity with connection stuff. You have connect the connection established event. You have the connection new event. Well, for files, what's the most obvious thing? File new. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like a direct comparison. We really, really tried to sort of enforce over and over that these are really kind of the same thing. Connections and files have very close similarities. Um, and then really, you're just saying there's this function in the files namespace that you're just saying, OK, so for anyone who's unfamiliar with this, that's the event name, and that's just something that comes out of the core of bro that you know, says, here, it's a file new event. And this FA file, if you look, there's going to be a script that gets installed somewhere called init-bro. init-bear.bro. That data structure, which is a record, will be defined in there. So you can look and see what other fields are in there that you may want to see. And then that's just the name of the variable, so it's f. Very similar to like C for connections. For anyone who has looked at bro scripts, connections are named C typically for uh, events, and files are named F. So anyway, you're just adding the analyzer to that file, and you're get, saying the analyzer name. And so John has actually added it out. So you're adding those three analyzers. And if you look at your files.log again after you run that, you'll have hashes. No. Wait. He asked if there is a if there's ever a situation where you're sort of in a race because I, I think his question is coming from sorry, you're in a race to call that before the file starts getting transferred. That is really complicated. Generally, I'm going to say no. We put a lot of thought into that. Um, in the file new event, it, it sort of buffers the beginning of the file a little bit, just briefly, because we need to get some data so we can do the libmagic thing. So like when the file new, there's already been a little bit of data it's seen, but it kind of replays that. Like it hasn't actually played that through any analyzers yet. Um, there are a lot of <laughs> Robin and John, I had the like four or five calls that just stretched on for, for three hours figuring out how this works. We're, we're gonna so say essentially, we have a number of sequence points, right? Basically, if you do certain steps before the next sequence point, you run into a race. So it's, it's kind of well-defined what happens. And you just have to run the order, but if you do this, it's so, so Robin pointed out we have the, what do you say, sequence points? Yeah, what's that other terminology? I have no idea. I don't think we really had a. John, do you remember what we were calling that? Synchronized points. Yeah, so the idea is like we, we do some tricky event flushing and stuff at just the right time. So, so one thing we ran into was data would start feeding through, but perhaps all of the HTTP header events hadn't flushed through yet, and then this event would fire before those had flushed through. So it's basically for HTTP, for instance, we actually at the when the body of the HTTP reply perhaps starts, we tell it flush events because to generate a file ID, we may, which is something I didn't talk about because it's, it's it would be horrible and I'm sure a number of people got lost just from talking about this already. But it's it's even worse when you go into that. Um, you may need information from those headers in order to create the file ID. So we had to say, we have to run all the bro scripts for the headers before we start to look at the, the file data. 
Anyway, if you run, if you get like one of these files like later on in the file and you attach an analyzer, the beginning of the file is already gone. So generally, file new, and there's another one called file over new connection. Um, that's generally where you're going to want to attach these because it means that the file hasn't happened yet. And you know, like for instance, you basically have to get all your analyzers attached right at the beginning because a lot of them, if you attach them later, things like the entropy analyzer could be a little different. You could attach that later if you are actually interested in doing entropy analysis later on, but that's sort of undefined what that would mean and stuff. Anyway, that was sort of off into the weeds, and most people aren't going to need to worry too much about that. Generally, this file new connection or uh, event is, is pretty cool and lets you really, it, it gives you enough information to where that's what you'll handle, and you'll be able to determine if you want to do something with a file. So did everyone get through that? Did anyone have any trouble or emotions, anger? Sorrow. Sorry, I'm breaking everything in Security Onion, guys. Um, SMTP entities log is totally gone. <laughs> so there are some logs that just disappeared. The SMTP entities log sort of turned into the files.log. Um, I think it's for the best. Work through the sorrow and the pain. It's not you, it's me. It's for the best. <laughs> we'll look back on this and laugh. Um, so OK, as long as everyone made it through that, that's cool. So this is where I think people start to get more interesting. And when I was looking through this, uh, the exercise John created this morning, John, I like that. That's cool. Your, your map for extension names. Um, Yeah, so basically all John did here, uh, did, did everyone run this? Did, did anyone run this, this exercise three? OK, cool, so there are some people. Did it work? Yeah. Yay, good. Did Mark get his death executable or should <laughs> Why not? You should run some random executables that you yank out of. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting, I'm, I'm waiting for, uh, I'm waiting for someone to write because I'm not going to do it because it scares me, to write a PCAP analyzer. And I suspect you all know where I'm going with this, that if someone sends a PCAP file over email, bro feeds it back into the traffic analysis and reads that. And <laughs> Inception. He asked, what if, it ha what if it's another email with another PCAP in it? <laughs> there, there are things that we have to be careful with. It's one of the reasons we're not really doing decapsulation like zip files yet, because we have to be careful. There is, there is a file on the internet that someone, I think it's unforgettable.dk. You go there, and there is some file called 42.zip that if you, it's like 40k or something like that. You unzip it, and it's like 16 one terabyte files. And then th those are all zips. And you unzip those. And there's like 16 one terabyte files in each of those. So we didn't do it yet because we've got to be careful. We, I mean, we obviously can't let, because you, someone goes and downloads that. And if we just gleefully run off and extract everything, it's like you're dead. Because I, I think that the total size is like 50 petabytes or something for this, for this file. It goes a few levels in, and it's, it's enormous. But so you can imagine, you attach the extract analyzer and the zip analyzer, and you just destroy your box, because you're not going to have any disk space. It's never going to finish looking through these files. Um, it's one of the things we didn't feel competent with it yet. We need to play with it. And we can't just, it's not something we can just jam into the release and be like, wee, you can unzip files. <laughs> because if we did that, I would make sure and regularly on everyone's network that I know is running bro request that file. Exactly. Destroy their bro cluster and then do something. So anyway, we didn't put that in because we don't want your bro clusters or your standalone to get destroyed. That seems like a somewhat bad idea. Um, so yeah, I mean, if this works, this is sort of something that's not included with bro. But you know, if you want to write your own script, you could extend <coughs> on this even even quite a bit more and make it do lots of other stuff. Yeah, Chuck. <laughs> no. 
No. Um, I haven't run across. I haven't run across. Have you? Anybody? The what? I'm, I'm going to say no. Yeah, it's sort of academic and stuff. But um, there, there is, and the one that you're playing with, there's actually a pretty good one. Just get Bro to shut itself down with a single packet. <laughs> We're going to fix that for the release, though. We can't do the yeah. release until that's fixed. Um, <laughs> Bro doesn't crash. It's not a crash. It just bro shuts itself down. <laughs> um, uh, there was there was a long time ago an accidental attack that used to happen to me at OSU. So for those that aren't familiar, I I started playing with bro when I was at the Ohio State University, and it was for OSU was always a big NetFlow place. I mean the the flow tool. It was the the reason they're called the OSU flow tools. The ones, maybe people aren't even familiar with them. That's what everyone used to use for NetFlow analysis. But um, so it was sort of like I came from this, you know, heavy NetFlow place, and um, we started running Bro. And a couple years later, I actually got it functional, and it, it just took me two years to get it to work. And um, we we st sort of stopped using the other stuff that we had as much, and. There used to be a problem with the way Bro sent emails. So it would send emails about stuff, like the notice emails. And I had it sending me no emails about something. I don't even recall what it was, because it was so long ago. But occasionally, I'd see these weird ones. It looked like they had in the email, I was, it was sending a URL that someone had requested. And it would have the output of the ID command run as root in the email that it was sending me. And I just puzzled for months as to what in the world that could be. And then one day, I looked at the code and suddenly realized that there was, a, there was essentially an injection happening. There, were, there was some testing software that was doing HTTP requests that had backtick ID backtick in the URL. It was running that as root on my bro cluster. The attacker didn't do it on purpose, but um, I very quietly went to the other bro guys and was like, we got to fix this. This is really, really bad. I don't want to talk about it. I think I had just gotten on the private bro dev list at that point. And anyway, it's fixed now. It's, you can put anything you want in emails, and it won't do that anymore. I hope. <laughs> Let's say that. No, actually, it shouldn't. We changed the way emails happen, so it, it's completely different now. And it really, really shouldn't do that anymore. I think <laughs> it's a, you know injection stuff's hard to, to really validate, but I'm pr I feel very confident that that's not possible anymore. Sort of like an SQL injection for Bro. Um, so, does anyone have any questions or thoughts or like? ideas for extension on the script or anything. I, I think that one of, one of the big things that's really helpful about Bro is just to talk. Not to talk about stuff that exists or stuff that's implemented, but just to talk about, well, what if we did this? Or maybe we can make it do this other thing. And that, that's really the only way we ever actually keep going with Bro is there's just a lot of pondering and very, very slow working and thinking for long periods of time and then merging everything in the week before the Bro exchange. Thank you, Robin. So, I mean, anyone have any thoughts on this, or like thoughts for extension, or ways you might want to use this, or use it slightly different than what it does now? Okay. So, everyone got? Did everyone get the email out? My daughter's art camp was this morning, in case anyone cared. Um, yeah, I think, I think that the output from that sort of represents the, uh, the 
careful connection that incident response teams take between being overly invasive and being uh, doing their jobs appropriately, where when it's that easy to extract email and look through email, you know. So and everyone really kind of figured out this one? Sometimes Bro makes the exercises too easy. There was a, I kind of liked it. There was a while ago, it was very similar to this one, where it has like a user agent in there. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of this Cloud Shark company. I was following them on Twitter, and one day they randomly piped up and said, hey, user Cloud Shark thingy, and look through the, it's like Wireshark on the internet. <laughs> And um, they, they said, use our thing and like, you know, solve these things, and you get a t-shirt if you win. My answer was in a tweet. I could actually, I managed to say, just run default bro, and then I did like bro cut and pulled a field out and found the thing that they were pointing out, and it just gave you the answer in the thing. It was like they were saying like something about the file name of an email attachment or something, and we were extracting that. So I was just like, all right, well, how about you go through the, the SMTP log and pull out all the file names? And I didn't want to like ruin it for myself and like find out if that would work and then run it and find out if it works. So I just took their trace file. I figured out in their interface how to download the packet capture. And then I ran it through Bro and did the thing. And it was like two minutes. And I had the answer. And I got a t-shirt, which is cool. But <laughs> I didn't do it the way they wanted me to. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, we kind of perpetually run into this problem, or we're starting to. Liam said, I, I, for some of the, the demos Liam's doing, he said I ruined his, or his demos because it made it too easy. Um, you just sort of run bro now, and it's like, well, there's the answer. So. Uh, did it, who got to this one? So no one really made it to this one? Oh uh, yeah, so the, so the important part of this one is really just the, just you know showing that this is a programming language, and guess what? You can write programs with it, which involves things as far ranging as if statements. We have if statements. We do not have general while stuff. For loops, you cannot do for loops. No, we don't. Oh yeah, all right. That's easy, so it's going to work. <laughs> so, uh, uh, David was pointing out that um, we're checking the existence of MIME type. So there's this question mark dollar sign operator, which is checking to see if that field is even set. Because it, if a field is null, you can't access it. And the MIME type field can be null sometimes. Um, so right there, it's just checking to say, if the MIME type is not set, return, because we, we don't want to do anything. Or if the MIME type is not application x dos exec, then return, because we don't want to do any of this stuff, because we're only extracting Windows executables. He pointed out that we're, we're double checking the MIME type here, that technically we don't need to check that, because when we've got to this point, we're already assured that a MIME type is set. So you can, no, 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 feel free to ask questions to be a jerk, that's because fine. <laughs> I'd do it. Um, no, because f mime type is not that. Oh, that's it. That's yeah. yeah, that thing is the ext map. Oh, yeah, right. That just gives you the ability to index into that and and not worry about checking to see if your field exists first. So anyway, I mean, again, this is something that I think in most tools would be kind of hard to like do this to say like you know I only want to like extract things if they're Windows executables. And I want to name them this certain way, where you know the name that comes out is going to be HTTP, because the the source is like the where it came from. So if it's from a protocol analyzer, it's going to be like HTTP or SMTP or whatever. Um, and then it's going to have that file unique ID, which is actually just called f dollar ID. Um, so it'll be maybe HTTP hyphen blah that random string of junk. And then the extension that was pulled out. So in this case, it's always going to be .exe. But like, 
That is something that is not terribly easy in a lot of other tools. And this is not something, we did not design it to be able to do this at all. Like, we didn't plan, I had never even seen this script until this morning when John, I guess last night when John pushed it out to Git, or to the Git repository. And that's what I like. I mean, that's what I like about Bro as, uh, in, a, in a really big way is that Bro is, is just a programming language. So really, the door is open. What do you want to do? Let's go to Security Onion. So I maintain a set of scripts for the Security Onion guys. There's, for instance, they the other tools they run, um, Snort and Suricata support this bpf.conf file instead of like, like so bro, we, we've kind of gone the tact of, you know, you can set a filter like dash f and give it a bpf filter to, to filter out traffic or filter in traffic or whatever. Um, the other tools went a different direction where they re they go and they pull a file off disk and they read it in and they, uh, they that's the filter they apply. And I think Doug complained to me one day because... I didn't complain. All right. <laughs> Doug commented to me one day that bro didn't do that. And it was, it was annoying or something. Whatever. Anyway. And... I wrote a script that actually implemented it. And I think, actually, that our, our, what Bro does, if you load that BPF conf script that I wrote, which we need to probably do something else with instead of just have it in the security onion thing. But right now, they're the ones that use it. Um, it supports a bpf.conf. So you can actually say, Bro, here's your bpf.conf, and it reads it in. It reads in all the same format that, uh, and this has nothing to do with the file analysis framework. I just got distracted, and I'm filling time. but. Um, so it reads it off disk, and it, it applies the filter, and it supports the whole weird thing they do, where you can actually put comments and stuff in your BPF filter. But with, jeez, really wants to tell me my daughter has art. Anyway, um, what we actually do is, is it's just a script. We have no support in Bro for doing this, nothing. But I implemented it completely as a script, and we even went further than what Snort and Zeracata do. If you, if Bro's running, and you change your bpf.conf in Security Onion, Bro will go, oh, you changed your bpf.conf. It'll reread it in and apply that filter. And if that filter fails, it'll actually do a notice to say you put a bad filter into bpf.conf. You don't have to restart Bro. You don't have to do anything. You have to restart Snort and Suricata. But Bro just sits there and updates the filter. And it'll actually tell you if you did a bad filter. But it won't fail. It'll keep using the old filter and not, just not apply the new one that it couldn't compile. But it's just a script. There's, there's no support in Bro for doing that at all. But that, that script is, I need to fix it, actually. I had to work around all sorts of bugs in the input framework when I wrote that. But, you know, I, I sort of wanted to draw the parallel where really we have no support for doing this thing with like extracting with the extension and everything. It's just a script. Did anyone do this exercise? <laughs> so now we're sort of tailing off in terms of people. So I can talk about this one real quick. Um, this is really just pointing out these other events like file over new connection, file timeout, file gap. So you can actually start seeing file over new connection is sort of a file domain specific event. File timeout, is there a connection timeout event? Or just connection state removed? It doesn't matter. It doesn't, there might not be. But file timeout, file gap, there is a content gap event for gaps and you know, like if a packet is dropped or something and there's a gap in the content of a connection. Uh, file state remove, directly analogous to connection state remove. Um, and, and file hash is coming from the hash analyzer. And there's going to be more. There, there's a whole set of events for Windows executables. There, there's an event for the file entropy thing. There's, there's events for various other things, too. Um, so file state remove is like, you know, the, the file for the files framework saying I'm done. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm flushing all of this from memory. I'm done with this file. I'm not going to look at it anymore. So John was really just pointing out that, you know, calculating what, what this script actually does. And this will be up forever, probably, because we have no reason to get rid of it. 
But um, you'll be able to look through this later if you want. You can actually see that what he's doing is uh, he's calculating the average file size, size served by a particular host, which is, is a toy. But you know, a lot of times toys are, are good ways to get introduced to, uh, to new parts of Bro. So again, it's sort of another thing that was a, a pretty short script that if you're familiar with how Bro works, it's a very, very easy script to write. And it outputs this thing that's pretty hard to get from, from really anything else. But you know, that's the entire script. There's nothing else. There's nothing hidden. That's the whole script. And feel free to ask on the mailing list about this if you would like help with this or want to know more about it or or something, the the part six. So anyway, um, I guess we can go ahead and go. It's, it's 10 till. Lunch should be at noon. They're probably getting set up, but people could just sort of mill around or whatever. Are there any final questions? So this is sort of the end of the files framework stuff. So this is one of the new cool things in the next release, and it won't be getting talked about a whole lot. Yeah, Mike. And, uh, the there, there is a way to do that. Um, So the question was, are you going to be able to specify where you want to dump the extracted files? Uh, there is a prefix thing, I, I think, where you can say, here's the prefix where I want to put files. There's all sorts of weird stuff you could do, too, where you actually extract the file. And I designed it this, this way on purpose, even though it's probably not what people would like exactly. But I have bigger ideas in mind, where you get to the end of the file. So for instance, say you want to name the file this is a completely weird example. But say you would like to have files put into directories by the year and month of their compiled date. right? So you're saying, if it's a Windows executable, I'm extracting it. But what I want to do is create directories that say 2012.03, and then put the file in there. And that's, that represents the month that that file was compiled in. So it's data that was pulled out of the file. So you can't start writing it to disk with that, because you haven't found out when it was compiled yet. That You find that out as it's analyzing the file. So maybe what you do is you sort of spool the file to one location. And at the end, the file state remove, you say, was it a Windows executable? Yes. And then you could do similar to, I don't know if you've, how much scripting you've done or not, Mike, but the uh, Similar to how you have like C dollar HTTP, and that's would be like the HTTP record for that connection. So it's essentially the log for that connection. You'll have F dollar PE. So you could say F dollar PE dot or dollar compile TS, and then turn that into the month and figure out the directory name and put and then move the file into there. So the door is kind of open. I, I didn't want to implement a specific thing yet because the it, it, I don't know what people want. So I kind of left it open like that. But there is this notion where, as time goes on, you're going to have more and more data pulled out of the file that you may want to name the file with, which you also have to be careful with. You don't want people injecting files on your system because you're not being careful with how you're extracting stuff and what file names you're using. Generally, though, the compile timestamp should be safe because you're given that as just a double or a timestamp in Bro. So it's not like someone can put, like, slash Etsy password or something, because you're given it as, as a time. Um, so anyway, feel free to comment on the mailing list or something. That, that's, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions people have about stuff like that. Anything else? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so th this is one of the things where I think if people were working on this, they might take a wrong turn. Because it's really easy to think of it that way, where it's like, I want the whole thing. And it's always nice to be able to say, I just want the whole thing. Although it's not really exactly proper. But the real idea is that we're doing sort of this hard work, and we're splitting everything apart. It is possible to put everything back together. Um, you could. There is, there is. That's the thing. All of this data is linked together. So okay. you can, it's all available. Where We're not throwing things away. So Look. in your script, you can say, I want to go pull back the header and all the rest of it. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, and, and the important thing is we tried to do things right to start off with, where the content or the attachment, is, that's the file. The headers are, are part of something else. Because if you think about SMTP, the SMTP protocol's here. And then everyone, I've seen so many people that will say, like, you know, the data command happens. That's something different. That's like an 820, RC822 message body or whatever it is. That's something different. Eventually, I want to make that a file analyzer where you know, we treat the after data is a file. It's, it's a MIME file, essentially, which then has files inside of it, which is like the body and the, atta the MIME attachments would be separate files. But um, all of that stuff, you'd still be able to dig back through all the way to, if it's a tunneled connection even, you'd be able to dig back through and find out that it was tunneled. Um, Uh, wait, sorry, what were you talking about? There's a microphone if you'd like to get up and have everyone stare at you. <laughs> Where was that grabbed from? No, I'm, I'm, I'm still unsure what your question is. Anything? Yeah. Um, ah. Yeah, sure. If you don't want to extract email, <laughs> for instance, um, that would actually be. So what you would do at in the. Can you find it? In okay. So let's say in file new. If you access f dollar source. If, it's, if, if the source is the SMTP analyzer, that's email. So you could say, if f dollar source equals equals, and it's a string, and it's all caps SMTP, then you could say return and, and don't do this stuff, whatever this stuff is in particular. Yeah, exactly. You, um, at that point, you have, remember in the log, I showed the it's available. So there's, there's also a vector in, or a, a table in there that's called cons. So if, it, if this file is transferred over a connection or connections, there will be the connections in that file that you can reference. Um, yeah, we don't have an example of that. It, it's a little goofy. One thing you could do, because at the point, if you handle this with no priority on it, you'll have that. Uh, if you do f dollar info dollar TX hosts, you'll see that these are the hosts sent, like the data is coming from these hosts. So you, always, you do have that available to you if you wanted to use that. Yeah, there, there's a lot of ways of doing it, but it, this was all the stuff I thought through when I was like, I can't not have this data available. It's got to be available because people are going to want to say, well, you know, let's do a GOIP lookup and, you know, stuff from this country I want to do something about, but stuff from this country I don't really care about. So. Um, yeah, e even in file new, you could dig. So if, if imagine a file is transferred to SMTP, you could go all the way as far as the SMTP log. You can look at the SMTP log from here. You have to dig back up the tree to get to it, but it's there, and it's, it's available to look at. There was, there was a lot of consideration that went into this to make that available and how we were going to pull that off and stuff, and it actually works. Is there some other question? I thought I saw someone. No. I am starving. And there, I suppose that there's lunch out there. So I guess that wraps up the files introduction and discussion.